welcome back after the break. So let us uh, start with more questions. I am already seeing quite a few questions on chat, uh, but I would like to start with some live questions. Okay, we have Tyagarajar College, Madurai. Uh, sir, uh, I have a doubt in uh, the example you dealt with uh, saying about BCNF, sir. Yeah. Uh, the table you used was uh, instructor underscore department. It relates both the instructor and the department. Right. But I think that uh, decomposition will happen when the relation uh, crosses second normal form itself. Okay. So, I think the question you are saying is, uh, if we wanted second normal form, would we have decomposed that particular relation in the same way? Uh, did we have to uh, wait for uh, 3NF or uh, BCNF? Um, in this particular case, uh, second normal form, like I said, in our book, we do not even bother about it uh, because we feel it is just of historical interest. Somebody defined it at one point. Uh, if you look at research papers, there are thousands and thousands of such concepts which people have defined at some point. And at some point, you want to say, you know, Please do not burden students with all these unnecessary concepts. It will just confuse them and uh, you know won't lead to anything uh, useful coming out of it. So the first thing I would say is just forget about 2NF. If you want unnecessary things, by all means go read the literature to read um, you know not just thousands but probably uh, tens of thousands of papers have been written on uh, databases, overall normalization and so forth. And there are many, many concepts out there which are not so important and should be best ignored. Uh, but since you have asked this specific question, I think in this particular case, it is not a partial key dependency. Uh, I think it is a transitive dependency because we had uh, ID to department and then department to uh, something else. Uh, so I think in this case, um, it is second normal form would not have uh, played any role. It would have already been in 2NF. Okay, let us move to some other question. Doubt in order by class, sir. Hmm. Uh, if there are some two uh, attributes in the order by class, hmm. then uh, how will the result get sorted? Based on the second attribute or based on the first attribute? That is actually fairly straightforward. Uh, whenever you sort by multiple things, uh, there is a standard uh, lexicographic sort order which uh, is very uh, basic in computer science and in real life also. So when you uh, sort uh, students by, let us say, uh, class and then within each class by roll number, this is exactly what you are doing. You are sorting on two attributes, class and then roll number. And databases, uh, SQL in particular, of course, allows you to sort on two attributes. So the first thing, uh, will the initially it will be sorted on the first attribute. Now there may be many tuples with exactly the same value for the first attribute. So those are relatively sorted using the second attribute. And SQL gives a lot of control over this. You can say the first one should be ascending, the second one should be descending, and so on and so forth. I hope that answers your question. Uh, at this point, I would like yeah, to request uh, more questions on uh, the current topic, which is uh, servlets and web apps. So please try to restrict your questions to this area. Uh, the next question is, what is the difference between the get and the post method? So the basic difference is the get method passes its parameters by uh, adding extra stuff to the URL itself. So it is explicit in the URL. In the post method, the URL does not contain the parameters, but the HTTP protocol has some further uh, back and forth communication through which the parameters are passed. In terms of writing the HTML file, the only difference is that you say method equal to get or method equal to post. Okay, there are a couple of other methods to use for uh, uh, sending uh, binary uh, large amounts of data and so forth. So uh, that is the only difference from your viewpoint, but the protocol itself sends it differently. Now from the viewpoint of writing servlets, you can write a do get and you can write a do method. Those You can write separate code for these two methods. Which one do you use? Uh, it depends. So get is recommended only for things that do not do updates. The uh, HT uh, TP protocol uh, specification strongly recommends against doing any updates based on a get method. Any update should only be done through the uh, things that use the post method. Nothing prevents you from writing a get method that updates the database, but uh, as uh, it, it's considered uh, bad to do this because sometimes there are web crawlers and so on. Google can come crawling. It will use the get method. If you do an update through the get method, uh, Google crawl can damage your database. 
So it's highly recommended against doing updates using the get method. Updates should only be done using the post method. And crawlers such as Google will not use the post method. They will only, uh, if they find a form with a get method, they will use it. With a post method, they won't. Another question is how to retrieve cookie information from the browser. So if you are the web server, you use HTTP to retrieve it. That's part of the protocol. If you are a user, uh, every browser has its own uh, way to look at uh, details through tools or uh, preferences or so forth. Then you can dig in and go to security or uh, so on. There's somewhere in there, there's cookies. And then you can view the cookies. Is it possible to have a constructor in a servlet? Can we use constructor instead of init? Now, uh, let me mention the init method. So we have focused on get and post method. And we have only seen get. Post is similar. Uh, it's pretty much identical in terms of the interface. Uh, the uh, init method is something which is used when the servlet uh, code is first invoked. So the very first invocation of a particular servlet will call the init method and that can be used to do some initial setup. For example, uh, we have some uh, thing at IIT Bombay which we use to do keyword search on data. So the init method will basically load the data into uh, memory. And um, then the uh, get method is used to query it. So the very first time the get method is invoked, uh, or, or the post for that matter, very the first time any method on this particular servlet is invoked, the web server will call the init method. And that is used to load data, whatever data we need into memory. We, we also access a database. But for performance reasons, certain things are loaded into memory first. Uh, so that happens in the init. Uh, now the question was, can you use a constructor instead? Uh, I, I'm not sure about the answer to that question. Um, but the recommended way to do initialization is to use init, not the constructor. Uh, one more question is, uh, is HTTPS connectionless or stateless? Connectionless is the answer here, because the connection can be closed. It doesn't have to persist. Stateless means that you can you'll completely forget everything about the state. In fact, it does maintain state uh, through cookies and other means. RBS uh, Uttar Pradesh, please go ahead. My question is related to ER diagram to relation conversion. Uh, in ER diagram session, you have taken an example of uh, model yeah. in which you have taken a course as a strong entity mm -hmm. and assignment as a weak entity. When we take uh, a relationship between course and assignment, in that case, uh, when we convert it to the relation, uh, uh, we, uh, course is converted to the relation directly by its primary key. Yes. But when we take the assignment, uh, in that case, we take the course primary key and discriminator attribute as a key for the weak entity. My question is here is that if both the entities are weak entities, in that case, how we will convert it to the relation? Is it possible to convert if both the relations are weak entity? Yeah, I think this question was asked uh, earlier. In fact, we had an example of that. Uh, so we made assignment a weak entity, which is identified by course. And then we had submission as a weak entity, which was identified by assignment. So that is exactly the kind of uh, situation you are asking about. So the idea is uh, fairly simple. Uh, so first of all, we start with assignment, which is identified by a strong entity. So its primary key is the primary key of the identifying entity, that is course ID, followed by its discriminator, so assignment ID. So the assignment ID now is local within a course. Assignment 1, 2, 3, 4 can exist in each course. So now the assignment is uniquely identified by course ID, comma assignment ID. Now, a submission is a weak entity identified by assignment, which is itself a weak entity. But the rule says, take the primary key of the identifying entity. In this case, the primary key of assignment is what? Course ID, comma assignment ID. So we take that, and then the discriminator of submission to create the primary key for submission. So supposing we had used a, maybe student ID as the discriminator for submission. Then we will take course ID, assignment ID, student ID. Uh, does that answer your question? Sir, another question related to cookies. Uh, sir, uh, when a uh, user send a request to the server, 
server sends the response or uh, cookies is stored to the browser yeah. uh, also you mentioned that the server also stores the cookies at uh, at server side yeah. but second time when existing user send the same request mm -hmm. how server knows that these request came from the previous user how uh, yeah. the uh, browser's cookie is compared with the server's cookie right so uh, first of all, the web server has to tell the browser, please give me the cookie with the following name. Okay, so uh, as I said, a particular web server can only access cookies that it created earlier. So the first time when you connect it, uh, a new uh, session is created. If you use the servlet uh, session uh, API, uh, you'd say request dot get session true, and a session is created. At that point, the server has uh, would create a cookie and send the cookie to the browser which stores the cookie. You don't see all this, it's happening underneath as part of the HTTP protocol. So now the cookie is stored on the browser. The next time you make a request, uh, the server asks the browser, please send me the cookie with this particular name. It gave a name, I mean the cookie has a name, uh, user info or whatever else the name was. So next time when the server says, do you have a cookie called user info, the browser will send that value back. And that value, like I said, is a, a string, randomly generated string. And the server will uh, take the value which it got back from the browser and look it up in its local storage to see if that particular string is already available. If it is available, then it is part of an ongoing session. Another related question which you didn't ask, but let me answer is, uh, what about session timeout? So typically, uh, any uh, web app, has a timeout. So if, if you don't use this thing for say 20 minutes or 5 minutes or 2 minutes or whatever else, the session expires. So what exactly happens is that the uh, web server throws out the information about that particular uh, session cookie. So what will happen is it will still ask the browser, do you have this cookie user info? The browser will send the cookie value which it has back and the web server will look it up in its database. Uh, it's not a permanent database, just an in-memory transient thing. It'll look it up. And what happened is because of the timeout, it threw that information away. And now when it looks it up, it'll say, no, I can't find it. So it'll say, uh, sorry, uh, you don't have an active session. And uh, it'll proceed to redirect you to a login page. Uh, so that's how uh, session timeouts are done. Uh, you can also, from your uh, servlet, you can explicitly invalidate a session. So that is an API call for invalidating the session also. If you want to log out the user, at that point you will immediately invalidate the session so that uh, the next time request that comes from that user, uh, the session will no longer be valid. I, I didn't show that, but that is part of the API. Does that answer your question? Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Uh, Bidla Vishwakarma College. Gujarat, if you have a question, please go ahead. Yeah. Uh, yes, sir. Can you just a little bit explain the life cycle of Java servlet in brief? Yeah. So the life cycle of a servlet, this is uh, something which I skipped for uh, brevity. Uh, but what happens is, so let me explain it intuitively. I am not getting into all the details, but uh, intuition. So first of all, uh, when you have created a servlet and compiled it, you have to tell the web server about this. So what you do is you deploy uh, this uh, thing by uh, either uh, copying the uh, files into the uh, web server, uh, the application server, uh, along with uh, some other configuration files, web.xml and so on, and start the server. Or you can actually deploy on an already running server. You can, there's a way to package all of these things into a single, uh, file called a var file and you can just deploy it. At this point, the uh, application server has access to all your code and uh, it knows the mappings between the URL and the uh, specific servlet code. But at this point, it doesn't actually do anything with it. It's just ready to be run when a request comes in. Now when a request comes in, uh, the first time a serv particular servlet is requested, the application server is going to uh, run an init method and that init method is useful for you to do some setup. So that's so something which I explained a few minutes back. Uh, we can use it to load some stuff into memory, etc., etc. And now that setup is complete, after that the method which was called get or post or whatever method was called, uh, that is actually executed. 
and um, that returns something to the user. So now further requests can come, uh, get post whatever. Uh, but you may also want to uh, close that servlet eventually. Uh, so there is a way to uh, tell the um, application server to uh, close this servlet and uh, turn it off. So usually that is done if there's a long period of inactivity uh, when this thing is not getting used anymore. So you might as well close it and release resources from the app server. Remember the init method uh, would have um, done some loading or could have done some loading of data into memory. Uh, what you want is if that servlet has not been used in a long time, maybe you want to uh, close it and release those resources. Uh, so there is a way to uh, tell the thing uh, servlet container to uh, close down this servlet. I won't get into the details, but there are API calls for these. So I think now let's get back to some new slides. Okay, so now let's move on. Uh, the next topic is scripting. So far we have been writing programs in uh, Java servlets. There are some overheads to this, you have to compile it, deploy it and so forth. Uh, and people found that writing scripts which are interpreted on the fly uh, can be a lot more convenient. So there's two kinds of scripting. Uh, one is called server-side scripting, the other is called client-side scripting. Server-side scripting actually came first and uh, it, the initial versions of it actually combined HTML documents with executable code inside it. And there are many alternatives. There's JSP, PHP, and many other alternatives for server-side scripting. I think I have an example slide here in JSP. So what happens is you write a HTML page. So the assumption is the bulk of your work in design is going to be HTML design. And this can be done by somebody who is not a programmer. Uh, they can use tools for designing HTML pages and create a HTML page. So all this body here, HTML head, body, uh, all this can be created by somebody who doesn't know programming at all. In fact, they don't need to know all that much of HTML for that matter because there are tools to create HTML. Now there are certain parts of this page which are going to be filled with dynamically generated data. Those parts, you do the following. For JSP, you simply say uh, less than percent up to percent greater than. Everything in between here in the context of Java server pages or JSP is actually Java code. So what we have here is actual Java code which earlier we would have written inside the servlet. So let me show this and then contrast it with the earlier servlet. So we have HTML as usual. Now here, uh, this is a very simple thing. It says if request dot parameter name equal to null, it says out dot print line hello world, otherwise out dot print line. Uh, name, get parameter name. So there are a few uh, things happening here. First of all, the parameter, uh, the variables request, um, out, response, uh, they're all uh, defined in a standard way. The request must be, would be referred to as request here, that's guaranteed. The response object will be called response. There's already a print writer out open on response. So all that is guaranteed at this point. So this Java code simply does whatever it needs with these objects. Now what actually happens with this, there is a, a compiler which takes this and generates a servlet out of it, compiles the servlet, and then it can deploy it. So uh, here uh, we basically had just HTML tags with Java code, but JSP also has some other tags which act as some kind of library. Uh, to contrast, if you see our servlet here, uh, the HTML code had to be inside of uh, Java code. We had say out dot print line, blah, blah, blah. This is quite tedious sometimes. So it's much easier for many apps to flip it and do it differently. Okay. So let me wrap up uh, with this slide on PHP, then we'll have our visitors come in. So PHP is another very, very widely used scripting language and Moodle is written entirely in PHP and many other very large projects are done in PHP. So this is also a scripting language. So you will see that you have HTML uh, coming up as this. But inside the HTML, you will have a PHP code written like this. Less than question mark PHP up to question mark greater than. Everything in between here is actually code written in PHP. Now this is a code which is interpreted and uh, by a PHP interpreter. And this code is 
uh, there is a language. PHP is a language. So it has uh, some things which you see here. It has if statements. It has echo, which prints the thing to the output. It has variables, uh, global variables, which are uh, preset. For example, dollar underscore request is a variable that stores all the uh, request parameters that you got. So if you say dollar underscore request, square bracket, and then single quote name, single quote, close square bracket. What is that? Uh, this is actually uh, equivalent to uh, request uh, dot uh, get parameter name. That's equivalent in uh, servlets. Similarly, um, uh, you know, echo goes to the output. There's an is set which says checks if it is defined or not, and so forth. So uh, with that, we will uh, take a break.